classic PR, that's, th that's a personal thing. You know, you go, go for the editors, you address them, you tell them the story, you inform them about the products. So that's all kind of one-on-one -on -one thing. Of course you have um, tools to do so, but still it's a very personal uh, thing that you do. It also covers targeted media because it's completely different if you are from Chanel or if you are from Nivea, you choose the media and with the media you choose the target group that you want to address. So usually everybody wants to be in the Vogue and in the L and in the NZZ or in the Welt am Sonntag or whatever, so the big names that everybody knows. But thing is, things have changed a lot in the last 13 years. So it's a selected outreach what you do in classic PR. Digital PR on the other side focuses on instant availability of information. So if an editor is looking into a topic, he wants to have a photo, he needs a contact, he needs an expert, um, whatever it is, he's looking for a special ingredient and what kind of product would have that ingredient, about a price, whatever it is, he needs that usually in the very moment. And that time, I can tell you, has been reduced to the very moment in the last 20 years, that, like I have seen that. So the other thing what digital PR can do is you go for a maximum outreach. You don't go for the, let's say, 150 or 200 editors that you personally know, but you go also for the stuff of the 150 or 200 editors that you know. So that doubles or triples it even. And then you go to other media categories maybe. So you go for maybe daily newspapers that are, are on a national uh, side available. So it leaves you a lot of opportunity to take care of a wider market and of, an, let's say, of a growing market too. So the good thing about digital PR is that it can be tailored. It's not that you say, I have to take them all or nothing. And that's uh, a way uh, that you can do with the specific tools that you use um, in the software that you uh, have developed. Also, another thing, if you're doing um, PR on a personal basis, you do that maybe six times a year, eight times a year, others do it 12 times a year, that you address the editors. But today, with these very short cycles, with digital media, with online websites, with bloggers, they need information kind of on a daily basis. So what are you going to do with that daily demand? You have to feed the beast, that's what we say. So you need a high frequency of outreach, or at least you have to be available on a 24-7 basis. So classic PR targets about 15 to 20 percent of editors. It's a personal touch which is decisive, and it's a pre-selected context that you're working with. Digital PR should reach out to minimum 90 percent of all editors looking for that specific topic and, let's say, just for the beauty. What they can do with digital PR, that's an independent research. You are not going kind of to influence them. And that's what they love because they should be objective. They are looking into information. They should look into neutral information and sources. So that's what they like. It's this, this do-it-yourself um, aspect of digital PR that they uh, worship very much. Turbulences in the media landscape. Well, you know, 15 years ago, with 100 print magazines, you had probably 85% of them or 80% of the market. So you were covering kind of everybody who was reading about the beauty. Today that changed dramatically over the years. And the predominance of the print media is declining from year to year, and this is really dramatically, as you will see on the next slide. So that's, uh, the PR environment changes, and you have to adapt to these changes in the environment, and you can't just stick with what you have doing the last 20 years, going for lunch and dinner with uh, important editors, and just uh, uh, leave it at that. So if you see a recent development of US magazines and the copies sold, this is just dramatic. And that this is not only for one year, but that is a continuous row of losses over the years, shows that this is nothing that you just can turn around in one or two years. 
So another thing which is very interesting is that you see TV, radio, newspapers are slightly declining in the percentage of respondents, uh, of respondents to news. The only one who is winning is the online platforms. So people are changing their, um, their behavior. They look more for the digital news because they know they get it firsthand, they get it immediately. If somewhere is some explosion or some whatever, they just can get it the other minute on their smartphone or in the internet. So that's what's making it so attractive. So this is really a dramatic rise. And the thing is that it is not only the, 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 the percentages that have sh been, been shifting into that cake, if you want to see it like that, but the cake is growing. So you have two things that you have to keep in mind. Your traditional contacts in the print media, they are getting a smaller and smaller share of voice, if you want to see it like that. And on the other hand, the market is growing bigger and bigger, so uh, you have to have more and more contacts into the editor community. So if you want to maintain your share of voice and want to have the same so visibility than what you have been before, you have either to grow your budget, get more person on board, get more uh, whatever, or you have to allocate it more effectively. The strategic solution is digital PR. And this is the only way how you can improve with, a, let's say, um, the same budget, uh, um, budgetary um, situation um, that you can reach uh, out to a maximum of editors in the relevant media and that on the other hand you can play a higher frequency. So you can go every month or every uh, two weeks and send out new information, giving an information about your product, maybe with a seasonal aspect, um, talking about maybe how, it, uh, how a new study that you have done is affecting maybe uh, this product and other things. So you have a, a constant approach with new and, and, uh, and interesting uh, things that you can tell the editors and through the editors um, uh, find your way to the readers and consumers. So this is a kind of what I would suggest that you shift about 10% of your uh, budget in the PR into digital activities. The question is for me not if, but it is digital PR. So when you decide on digital PR, what should you do? Should you do it in-house? Should you do it outsourcing? Uh, what is the, the clever way <coughs> uh, to do it? And I think um, that was a discussion this morning um, with one of uh, the participants. I think if you are a beauty company, you're not an IT company. So this is not your real business to do a platform and to handle it and to have content and you know to develop and things like that. So of course, if you would do it, you would do it on a small budget solution. You would say, okay, um, editors can go there, they can search uh, for my products, but it's technically simple. And of course, it's only branded uh, press information. So you, you talk about your brand. You don't talk about the market, about other th things that might be interesting for the, for the editors. You also have a limited lead media list because maybe uh, 400 people uh, or editors find your website or get the information that there is something that they could find on your website. So it is never the whole community. And through that you have an insufficient visitors and traffic uh, um, on your website. And for a lot of uh, companies, it's uh, also the question, do you want to have one or two more people on the payroll, or would you better go for outsourcing? The PR network, on the other hand, is the big picture oriented. Um, the PR network has to look for m more things, if you want to see it like that, than be centered on a single brand. So, of course, uh, you have to look for the big picture in the market with the brands, what about experts? What about events? What about expositions? What about new trends? What about legislation? So this is a whole spectrum that offers the, the editor the, a very convenient way to get all these information at one resource. And that's what is completely different to the, if you want to see, to the, to, to the way we work uh, than to the way a beauty company would work. So of course we're looking into 
advanced technological solutions and in very easy handling, self-declaring things. And as my son told me once, he said, Mom, actually, you know, your users, they have the level of a housewife concerning the way they deal with the internet. And that's true. It has to be simple for the editors. Um, they have to be not to especially trained to use the internet to find their way and the, uh, the information that, they see, uh, that they're looking for. And of course, you have to cover more than 90%. So um, when we look into a new market, we want to have a minimum of 900 to 1,000 beauty editors in that market. And that was a number that 12 years ago, I would never have ever anticipated that I would reach that in any, in any country. So I started with 139 editors in Germany, and I ended up last year with 2,100 in Germany and another 250 in Austria and Switzerland. So just to give you the, the dimensions that you have to have to really cover that market. Of course, through that bundle of information that we can deliver in a network, we have very high traffic and downloads, and that's what you actually want. And uh, just a number which is, I think, extraordinary for everyone who is working in digital um, is that of 100 pages that an editor looks at in our PR network, he downloads 49. So 49 different images or PR releases are downloaded out of 100, and I think that's really astonishing. Of course, we can offer a cost-effective solution because we buy the cost to a lot of our customers, if you want to see it like that, and do the best for the editors on one side and for the companies on the other. So it's a professional solution. It's a multi-brand portfolio. It's a neutral link between the industry, the press, organizations, and shows. It uses advanced services like a Dropbox or search engines. Um, and it has a guaranteed return on investment. So again, if you look at that, we have the associations, the companies, and the trade shows that feed primarily the press room. From there on, we wire it out to the editors, freelancers, bloggers, but also, if it's important, uh, to, the, to the companies themselves. We also post it in social media. So through these three uh, bundles, if you want to see it like that, we are reaching out to print media, to online media, to bloggers, to freelancers, and reach out to the, 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 the community there uh, that you want to reach. Very important is um, every company has their connections in the, let's say, surrounding um, of, of the markets where you are. The network also does the same thing. We are working very intensely with trade shows, with industry associations and professional organizations. We display their information to the beauty editors, but also to the companies if it's uh, worthwhile. So that is a very give and take situation that we have um, in that uh, respect. How does it look like? That's uh, the um, American uh, platform. You see we have a brand portfolio. We have, we have a brand for portfolio where you can look for uh, all the brands that are listed in an alphabetical order and see um, what they have uh, listed in our, in our database. You see that there is another thing which is very important for the editors is the latest launches. So you see by month listed what product has been uh, coming into the market. Um, you see here photos, stories, and videos that covers, for example, fashion week shows, but it also covers like, an, uh, like a thing like the Intercost the last two days. So we will, there will be an after show report and everybody who wants to read it can read it. Um, and you see that is a technical kind of thing. We have a Dropbox, so that is very easy for the editor. He can put his material that he has researched for his next topic in that Dropbox kind of, you know, wrap it all together and zip it in one go and not have to, you know, uh, address every single uh, piece of information that he wants to get. Latest releases is a very, very important um, category. Here we show the latest six releases that have been coming into the portal, and you can go for another six uh, back the next uh, um, two weeks and see what has been happening while maybe you haven't 
uh, being able to go on the platform. Of course, we have um, the menu structure. We have, and this is very interesting, and that was a risk uh, when I did it a year, year before, we started with topics of the week. So we are giving ideas to editors what they might be interested in, in giving to their con consumers or readers. Um, so we do a neutral background information, we talk with as experts, we give statements, we look, look into that, for example, Great Gatsby style or whatever, and then we uh, display that information to the editors with 12 different products, that's at the moment what we can do in maximum, with 12 different products that are in correspondence with that new topic that we have been highlighting. So a lot of um, service, a lot of information, a lot of ideas, and uh, I know that a lot of the, uh, the freelancers, especially, or the, the magazine with editors who have to display new topics and new pages on a weekly basis are very happy to have a tool like that. So that's just to give you um, a brief idea of, about um, what uh, we do as a service, if you want to see like that for the editors. This is one of our clients, uh, Pantene Pro V. Uh, they display on a typical brand page, they display what the, the, uh, what the product does, um, what it costs, where is your partner in the PR department or in the PR agency that you can address. You see the photos that you can get in high and low res, you can put it in the Dropbox. Um, and uh, this is a, a very easy way and very um, simple way to get information very short and very quickly. So, few rest facts and figures. We cover eight countries. I started in January 2000 in Germany. Um, I launched in the US in um, April 2009, not knowing that that was the kind of bottom point of an economic disaster. Uh, which took me maybe a one and a half year to kind of, you know, to recover with the market. Um, and I started in May 2011 in France. And I have to tell you, France is already on the same level as we are in the U.S., or let's say almost. Um, so the France, uh, France seemed to be much quicker um, to adapt to that system. Maybe it's also the, that we are nearer to the market than in the U.S. Um, but I think it's... Uh, Sometimes I get the question, um, but the editors in, in such and such country, they were completely different. And I say, no, if you really look into it, if you talk with editors, they all have the same problems. They all have to have information quick and easy. Uh, they want to have photos, they want to have access, and I think that's what we cover. Therefore, I think this is not a local kind of tool, but it's really a tool that can be marketed in, in more or less every country. So. It is astonishing um, that we have more than 6,000 beauty editors covering through these three databases in three different langu languages. Uh, through that, we are at the moment the number one international PR network. I haven't seen anything like that. But I know that there are, of course, uh, people thinking about it. There are other um, databases in the UK, for example, who try to do uh, probably the same what we do. But um, my, let's say, my credo is to be faster, quicker, better <laughs> um, than anybody else, um, and uh, to make it work uh, for my company. So I've did that in how many? A little bit over, so, but last time I did it in 30 minutes, so you were very lucky. 